Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Silicon Global online show, Ask a VC series. We've been doing this uh, for more than two years now, and we've had a number of venture capitalists from around the world join us. Uh, and today we are in Austin, Texas, uh, with a, a wonderful venture capitalist who is going to be telling us about his background and what his firm does. So before we get into that, though, I do want to say that we're focusing right now on Texas this month. During April, we're in Texas uh, virtually, although I was in Texas last month in person and we had a wonderful event in Austin. And we're hoping to do that again uh, in September and also in the spring. But today we have April 11th uh, at 4 p.m. East Coast time with Chris. And then in two weeks time, uh, April 26th, it's actually a Friday because uh, that's the availability of the venture capitalist. And we're gonna be having Aaron Perman from S3 Ventures also based in Austin. So a few words about Texas, you know, uh, just doing a lot of research on Texas, finding out that it's uh, really risen very fast. Um, and is now the eighth largest economy in the world and sixth largest VC investor in the US and the top exporting state. So there you go. I thought California was the top exporting state. So maybe Chris can correct us here. Uh, so Chris is with ATX Venture Partners and uh, he is gonna be talking about what the firm does. Um, for those who are just joining us for the first time, a little bit about what I do. I'm a content person, journalist, book author, and also a series uh, host with this online show. Uh, I have written a few books. Uh, the latest one is Silicon Heartland, which is one of the reasons we are on the Texas theme right now. And also Texas is very hot with uh, NAFTA and Mexico and supply chain issues and hardware and AI and semiconductor manufacturing. All of these hot areas today, Texas is uh, very, uh, much an influence. Okay, so a little bit about Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, as I mentioned, is managing director of ATX Venture. Uh, he set that up uh, actually a while ago, and he brought in two other partners, and they began investing. Uh, and uh, he has also been investing since age 14. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, Chris. Age 14, what were you investing in at age 14? I mean, I was mowing yards and cleaning pools and doing household chores in suburban Houston. I had a crew of people doing that with me, so. Okay, all right. So lawn mowing business, and uh, I guess it was, um, you know, a lot of lawns. <laughs> um, anyhow, so Chris has always been uh, a very proactive person. Uh, you know, when I did some research with him about in prep for the show, um, it was amazing all the different walks of life he's led. He's been an operator, an investor, a fund manager, an LP allocator. Uh, he's been in the military. He's done investment banking. He's had three exits, acquisition, buyout, and IPO. Uh, he's on the board of the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, born in Ohio, like me, except that he was born in Northern Ohio and I'm born in Southeastern Ohio, but that's okay. Um, he made as a base camp Houston, which he already mentioned Houston. So we'll talk maybe a little bit about why Houston. Um, very well educated, MBA. Um, and, you know, I like to put in the quote of the, uh, the most quotable quote of the VC that we are highlighting. And in this case, I dug this one up. Success is a team sport and capital is a commodity. So these are some of the issues that we're going to be talking to Chris about. And so you can make sure that your questions kind of revolve around these areas. So ATX Venture Partners formed in 2014. It's an early stage venture capital firm. That's, that's what we do. You know, we like to be around startups and entrepreneurship. And so... ATX Venture the same way. They have $600 million under management for funds. They're investing from Fund 4 now at $100 million and maybe soon more. Um, fund 2 went institutional in 2017. Fund 1 was Chris, right? Um, ATX is very heavy into business-to-business uh, -business software, logistics, and supply chain. Uh, they're investing in Texas and South Central U.S., 
Uh, some of their portfolio companies that we'll be talking about are Slingshot Aerospace, Macrofab, Protopia, Setpoint, and a few others. So at this point, I am going to go into our conversational chat. And in the meantime, you can get your questions warmed up for the Q&A portion of the program where you get to ask Chris your direct questions. All right, so let's get started. All right, everyone, um, Chris and I are on here. And uh, Chris, uh, what did you think about, did I leave anything out in the intro about you? I think that was succinct and pithy and all the good stuff. So yeah, no, it's great. Okay, good, good. So uh, tell us about why Houston. Why was Houston uh, base camp? Well, I mean, growing up, so I'm, you know, Ohio, like you kind of Midwest, uh, but my dad worked for Marathon. So if you remember Marathon Oil out of Ohio. Sure. Um, and all Ohio domestically, I mean, all oil domestically in the US kind of, you do a, a tour through Houston for the most part. So my dad was in uh, in the oil business as, as, a, as the only technical guy in the 80s, 80s and 90s, right? So this is back when it was all geophysicists and geologists and all that. And he was the the tech guy. So um, grew up in Houston and abroad. So it was an expat. So oldest of eight kids, traveled around the world following dad, who was, you know, again, tech guy in the oil industry before that was really even a thing. Uh, but we got to live in South America, Africa, Asia. You know, this is pre-horizontal drilling, pre-fracking. So all the, all the easy oil had been gotten to and domestic lifting costs were high. So you went abroad. And you sent your executives over there to do joint ventures and kind of partner with, uh, you know, foreign owned oil companies who would then bring in usually two U.S. operators and they would form a JV and start with the CEO and kind of stack it all down. CEO, COO, CFO, CTO. And my dad was always a CTO. So that was kind of my, my path as I saw, you know, the world from a global perspective, didn't kind of see it from the American sort of myopic Pollyanna right. lens. And so, you know, and really saw um, technology early into heavy assets. I mean, like, you know, there wasn't a lot of top graduates from tech schools going to raise their hand and apply to be in big oil back in the 80s, right? That was just not normal. And so I think that kind of framed things. And then, you know, being the oldest of eight, you know, 10 people in our family, you kind of get used to having a we, not a me. So you're always part of a team. And then I watched the importance of technology become more and more you know, relevant and kind of, and really foundational for the petroleum industry as they went into horizontal drilling and fracking and America became, you know, America, United States, and there's lots of Americas, right? But the United States became, you know, a, a global leader again through innovation to be able to get oil out of the ground uh, at a, a price that made sense. So that's kind of my story and, you know, where I grew up and how I got into Houston and, you know, I live in Austin and Colorado now, so. Right. So why did you make the move to Austin from Houston? Well, you know, if you pull any Texan who's been there for a while, I mean, Austin's kind of like our Berlin, if you're German, it's the kind of heart of Texas. I mean, it's rock and roll, it's college students, it's fun and food and hill country and, you know, lakes. And it is kind of the place from a lifestyle perspective that I think most people would like to live, especially mm -hmm. if they're on the younger kind of, or technical techn technology side. And so that's what really brought me there. You know, grad school brought me there, moved there for an end of the dot-com bust. And that very quickly collapsed after I got there and everybody took shelter getting their JD or their MBA or backpacking Europe or joining the Peace Corps or something to let that wave roll over us. And then I stuck around and started building companies and really fell in love with the community and became a big part of it. Right. Uh, now you noted that you were filling a gap in the marketplace in setting up ATX. Can you talk about what this gap was and how ATX Venture fills that? Yeah, sure. So that that's kind of funny. I was just talking about that earlier with a couple of OG Austin operators. So so back then it was really it was Dell semiconductors and a little bit of enterprise software from Trilogy and some other stuff. But it really wasn't the the technology hub it is today. It just wasn't right. Um, so anybody that had a company that was a technology company, which was about 12 of us that all had raised venture capital and we had largely raised it from um, coastal kind of overlords, right? Like the money was in Bay area in Boston. It wasn't even really in New York. I mean, 
the double click guys had just started doing some stuff, but it was not, New York was, you know, private equity buyout in hedge funds. It wasn't really venture. So we all would, you know, meet on the nerd bird, which is the plane that left from Austin to land in SFO. We go out there and, you know, you get a term sheet for your series B. And it was like, you need to move your company to, to the Bay area. If you want to take this money. And it just wasn't, it's funny. It's all completely opposite now. They're like, you know, stay there, by the way, can you sign a bigger lease? We're going to send some Californians your way. You know, it's, it's funny how it's changed. But we did that because, you know, after we, you know, started having exits, you get to know everybody because we're all recruiting talent. We're all trying to figure things out. You know, you're just sort of, there was this tribe of people who are like, look, I'm just trying to find product market fit. or I'm trying to raise my series B or I'm trying to recruit a, a CEO and step aside and be chairman. You're like, what's that like? And, you know, we would just share information. And so you started sharing office spaces, started sharing information. You know, if, if we did a big giant um, casting call for a CMO, and ours was, you know, more of a go-to-market through channel motion. But we interviewed some really good people that were like direct marketing, direct sales. We would say, hey, here's some people that we really like, but they're just not the best for our business model. So we shared talent. We started cross-pollinating each other's cap tables. Then we started an angel network that I was on the board of for the first four years to kind of get that stood up. Um, and yeah, and then basically the thing that was missing was like uh, the was the truly institutional capital post angel friends and family pre bay area kpis there was like this this dearth of of professional capital to help companies kind of bridge that and more mature markets had already had that i mean that was already a known thing in the bay area so nice. we started atx seed ventures which is basically um, a consortium of the best and brightest founders that i knew so it was all operators and all venture backed operators. So not just, you know, not a bootstrapper, not like it was like people that had raised money from VCs, had driven their company to an exit, made their employees money, made themselves money, made their, their fund managers money. So you have GPs on speed dial, you've got talent on speed dial, you know, kind of what you're doing. And we wanted to have a fund for us by us. And so that was fun one. And that was a good chunk of my money. And it was not, it was all friends just doing co-investments, trying to help younger versions of ourselves execute in an area that we thought was on fire. Right. Well, that's a fortunate spot to be in, to be able to start your own fund with your own money. So tell us about some of these exits that you had, the IPO, the acquisition, the buyout. Uh, how did those happen? Yeah. So, you know, I always had this um, sort of thesis of using technology as an enabler, like as a tool. So, you know, in the military, I was in special operations in South America. You've got 12 people. You've got a medic, a commo guy, a demolition kind of engineer guy, weapons guy, all this stuff. And you're like, how do 12 people act like a thousand? And so you have to have some force multiplier, you know, effectively it's leverage. We'll use that term in a business sense, but technology is my favorite leverage. You know, there's, you can only chase cost of capital down so low. You can bring in all, all the MBAs and hire the consultants to disaggregate your supply chain. You can top grade your executive team. Like it's all kind of commoditized on what you can do. And that's generally the world of like growth equity buyout is the knob turning incrementalization, right? But how do you get step function lift in a business? It's got to be through like, this was once dumb and now it's smart. This was a hard asset. It was asset intensive and now it's asset light. This was five humans and now it's two humans and some software. And so that was always it is how do you take something that is an interesting and compelling big market that's either too asset intensive or not tech enabled enough, or the talent isn't appropriately in a Darwinian sort of fashion, solving its own self to drive more efficiency into the business. And the fastest way to get there was software and automation and ML and AI. And now everybody's talking about AI, but we all think, I think we all know that's been around for a long, long time. So that's kind of how we came into it. And, you know, from my perspective, I fell in love with the pawn shop case study in grad school. I, I couldn't see how you could lose money in this business. Like you're, you're loaning on this thing at some LTV where you can't lose, but they weren't online and they weren't doing centralized inventory management. And it was mom and pop fragmentation. Even if you take out the public companies, it was 90% mom and pops that couldn't get past two or three stores. And so I came in, I built centralized inventory management software to get them all sharing information. 
Um, and then we started auto listing things on eBay and Craigslist back when Craigslist was around and a big deal for larger items, you know, wave runners and motorcycles and things like that. So they don't sit there and take up a bunch of space in your small footprint of real estate. And then we went on a buying spree. So I teamed up with the CEO of a, of a public company that was in the pawn shop business that had founded it and kind of rolled out. And I said, Hey, look, you know, pawn shops, I know tech let's go. And so we started rolling up, um, other pawn shops. It was super accretive uh, because as soon as we would buy them, we would centralize our inventory. We drive more efficiency in their business. We'd nail their pricing better because we had online. We turned their inventory 15 times faster. So probably not a big deal for tech people on this call, but like a 15 X inventory turn is a big, big deal in a small box retail world. And so that was a great run. And we were distributing 20 to 25% dividends a year and growing 10 X a year for four years straight. So I didn't know how good I had it. And all my family office buddies were like, never sell that. What are you doing? And I was like, you know, easy for you to say, you've got $500 million liquid or a billion dollars liquid. And I'm just, you know, cash and checks and building this business. And we got an offer. So I ended up, you know, we sold that. I'm still kicking myself because I can't find that kind of yield. <laughs> um, but anyhow, but that was just kind of phase one. So did that. Um, I got into video games early looking at the mobile phone as a new screen. So, I mean, it's intuitive now. Um, back then it wasn't really, I don't think a lot of people got the, the, the power of having a PC in your pocket. And I was like, with that will come commerce with that. Cause this is back in the Palm Pilots. Remember Palm Pilots and they had their first little games and everything. But then as soon as the, the legitimate smartphone came out where you didn't have your flip phone over here and a Palm Pilot over here, where you actually had the functionality of a handheld database scheduling tool, contact management tool with your communication tool. And then that the browser came and apps came and we were just like, wow, this is amazing. We got to get in this. So we got in early and it was, you know, us and a handful of other companies. And um, we were one of the top gaming companies in the world, right? So it was, you know, Zynga, us, a handful of others. And we timed it just right. So the thing about the gaming space is it's very hit miss. Like it's either champagne pops or dumpster fires. And we got out right at the right time where, you know, customer acquisition cost free, right? App stores empty, K factor six. If anybody knows what K factors are, we had a six K factor for a year straight. Um, yeah. And I was a co-founder of that. And I was also one of the preferred investors for the seed round. So what was, was the name of this company? So this was Sneaky Games. This was Sneaky Games. Okay. Sneaky Games um, is, is the name of the company. Yeah. Um, it was great. It was great running. You know, we, we went, you know, public internationally. So we went public. It became, we put some companies together, made it Zatica. And we had multiple studios on multiple continents. Um, but that's when I got to learn about, and then almost all my friends sold to Zynga. So they were underwater for almost a decade with their stock, right? Because that was great until it wasn't. Um, but really smart people. And so the thing about that was the timing and also getting your shares registered and how it works to exit that way. And then the other company I had was a, a chain of spas. I mean, we're living in Austin. Whole Foods is headquartered there. A lot of, lot of healthy sort of lifestyle, kind of the hippie factor. And I just saw wellness as being a category that was androgynous, old people, young people talking about it. Um, I thought there was going to be healthier lifestyle choices. And I wanted to get into the wellness space because I had made some money and I, I cared about kind of what I ate and what I did. And the, the, the girls I were dating were all into that stuff as well. And um, that was great. We built an app and ran that business and um, created the first sort of, you know, 401k and centralized, you know, HR W2 plan for what was a large workforce of 1099 independent contractors. So it was really nice, I think, from a humanity perspective to take what I would consider to be a demographic of very good people. I mean, if you're a, a body worker or a massage therapist or something like that, you're probably a very altruistic person in general, right? There's other things you could do to make a buck besides laying your hands on somebody and trying to help them. And, right. But they were all trying to, trying to manage a business, didn't have healthcare, couldn't save money. And I was like, bring them all together, put them on a W-2, give everybody a group health insurance plan, give them a 401k, give them guarantee paycheck and let's go. And so we did that and that was great. And then I um, got married and uh, said, you know, enough of this retail. It's a constrained business. It's been fun, but I only want to do infinite things, not finite things. 
and I like technology better than services. And so that led, led me to doing that specifically and founding ATX along with my band of merry brethren and sister and back in uh, 2014. Well, well, that's great. It all sounds very uh, planned out, but even though it probably didn't seem that way at the at the time, I'm just thinking, how did your military experience, you know, this very kind of controlled environment uh, play into the way that you operate as a venture capitalist? Good question, Rebecca. Very few. It's funny. I think that there's, that is probably the most profound thing I've done that has given me an edge as a VC and it's all so overlooked, you know, it's, you know, wasn't some Ivy League school, wasn't some amazing professor, wasn't some series of podcasts running around with a dozen Mensa qualified, super fit, unconventional warfare Jedi in a third world country where you're not supposed to be there and they probably don't want you there, right? Uh, makes one be resourceful and think outside the box and yeah. be able to analyze very quickly. But then I think mo almost equally important, if not more so, make a decision, forward progress, move, do something. The world is surrounded by smart people who fall into analysis paralysis. And what you need to do is sift through what's the, what matters? What are the, what's 95% directionally accurate that needs to happen right now? And what can I learn on the fly or by teasing data or by launching an MVP or something like that? And so I think that sort of early stage, not afraid to break some eggs to make an omelet, you know, risk managed well is not really as risky as one would think. So I think that's the difference is if you pull people out there like, oh, angel investing, early stage, venture capitalist, starting a business risky. My first question would be is, well, how much, what can you control? First of all, what's important? So this risk you're talking about, break that down. What, what is the risk you're talking about? Can you control it? Can you influence it or neither? And if you can control it, well, it's not as risky as you think. If you can control it and influence it, not bad. If you can do none of the above, you're wasting your life, right? So I think that's kind of it, you know, and when you're used to the, the downside not being, ooh, I maxed out my credit cards or, you know, I shamed myself in front of my peer group by this failed business. And you're actually talking about burning in on a parachute or taking a bullet. It's a different level of thinking. Mm. So what can you control and what can you influence in venture capital? You can control terms, so that's great, you know, and, um, you know, that, that, but a term sheet, a great piece of paper is only good if things operate as one thinks, right? So I think there's a lot of people who get super excited about how amazingly clever their financial engineering is, but if the company doesn't go on a run and deliver a bunch of value, who cares, right? You've, you've masterfully planned nothing, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think on the influence side, like if you're, I'm a minority investor, I stopped being an operator and I'm not buyout. I think that's a different animal. You got to separate private equity into the buyout people and the venture people. And then venture really is the growth equity people and then the early stage people. And I love early stage. I love going from zero to one. I like figuring out something new, not something in incremental. And uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's where the fun is. And, and frankly, I think that all asset classes are not created equal. I mean, I'm an LP and a lot of funds. I was a uh, you know, an, an investor, an allocator before I was a fund manager, right? Because I had those exits and I was just sprinkling money around into different things and kind of following my family office buddies into their boring sort of hard asset yield plays and different things. But um, it's important. You got to have that perspective and think like a CIO. Don't think like a CEO. See, that's all great to think like a CEO, but one day you're going to get handed a bunch of money and then what? Mm. If you think like a CIO, then you know the world you're in and controlling and then you know other peers that are adjacent to you. So like, I love talking to buyout people. I love talking to growth equity people because I'm venture. I like talking to pharma and healthcare venture because I don't do that. And so we all get together, even hedge funds. My co-founders, X Millennium, X Perry Capital, she's liquid strategies, you know, but we all have LPs. We've all, we all have to make investments and we all have to lead our teams. Those are the three universal things about taking the pill of being a fund manager. Your stakeholders are, people that gave you money, the people you're giving money to, and then the folks that are working with you. And that is super important. And most people drop the ball there because most fund managers are not operators, which means they're not organization builders, which means right. frankly, they're usually savants who have no idea how to lead or follow. But if you can crack that and be in the right place at the right time and the right asset, that's pretty fun.
Okay, I, I'm on board. <laughs> you, you've convinced me. <laughs> you know, I like this operator kind of mentality, this doer mentality. And um, I'm sure that's played into everything you've done as a venture capitalist. And so maybe you could just talk a little bit about the deals that you've done. I know you're very focused. You have a very strong focus on um, things that are strong in Texas as well. So talk a little bit about some of the deals that you've recently done that you'd like to highlight. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I really, I, I really, we kind of have a make, make it, move it, monetize it strategy. Okay. Like the, where Texas was, I mean, it was hard assets. It was things being manufactured, big giant port. Like you said, the exports, that's a very real thing. The, a lot yeah. of people don't know how much export happens. So that means you're international. That means you're moving things straight up, right? You're probably going to manufacture them or at least house them on the way. So we went heavy intermodal, process automation, supply chain visibility, ERP, all the way from raw materials being assembled, procuring those materials, manufacturing those materials, warehousing them, trains, planes, automobiles, boom, back to warehouse, onto a barge, overseas, payment, 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 insurance, insurance, trade finance, the whole time continuum. So that's all I do is I just stand in this domino world of global globalization and play risk and monopoly simultaneously with international co-investors around where is the labor arbitrage chips in chips out you know china good china bad mexico on mexico off because right. i don't really care about the next dog walking app or some cool new social media thing all i know is that there's a bunch of us seven plus billion who expect to walk to their fridge and grab something to go to the gas pump and get the gas and no one appreciates how this got there and if you can kind of Milton Friedman it of like, how did this pencil actually come to be? That never sleeps. It's global and it's resilient and it's ripe for software. And I think that's just fun. So I like doing the non-sexy stuff. Every time I go to the, the Bay Area and hang out with my buddies, I let them show all their postings and, you know, like all the influencer stuff. And I'm just like, great. You got to get in your car. You got to go put a towel on, take a shower, consume a bunch of stuff, eat something, send your kid off to school. That's all supply chain. That's our world, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, supply chain is, is very much uh, a very topical today uh, because of geopolitical issues. And right. uh, yeah, so Texas is right there in the center of some of these changes well, as well with Mexico and well, in space too, you know, like if you, you know, the one thing is, is, you know, I just got back from the Gulf, you know, uh -huh. there's, a, there's a lot to like over there. In fact, I think the Gulf is a lot like Texas in some ways, um, from a his, like history, the land, everything about it. Right. But people forget semiconductor. It was, you know, Dallas in Bay area. Yeah. And, and NASA, you take that and space is now a thing, right? So we have a couple right. of great space investments, but it used to be the land of government only contracts. It was too expensive other than a couple of big telecoms, but that's all changed, you know, and Elon and all of his companies have moved to Austin and they're all around Texas, right? So there's this whole diaspora. And then I think what's interesting is like, you get this, like the, the cap table sort of waterfall when you have an exit, it's not just the money. It's the experience. So when you get these people together that know how to build businesses that take institutional capital and create wealth, that knowledge and money sprinkles. And today's vice president is tomorrow's C-suiter and this founder is a chairman one day. And you just want to be part of that. And then you're living, I mean, you know, it. it's your backyard, Rebecca, but like to be in on the foundational level of that in a growing market is kind of like going back into the Silicon Valley and like the you know, the late seventies, early eighties, like it's not a big universe and the good actors know each other very quickly. And you can get, you can be a big fish in a small pond and then watch that small pond be a big pond. That's exciting. Right. Oh yeah. So bringing up the geopolitical, uh, geopolitical angle on this China into Mexico, into the U S is this something that you're watching? It is, you know, and it comes up, you know, we've got several companies that are operating in Mexico, cross border, you know, ITAR certification type stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of companies applying to be customers and you have to kind of the old KYC, like, where is this company? Oh, Luxembourg. Okay. Really? Who's in it? You know, and kind of, you know, what are we making exactly? And where is it going? Right. Um, because, you know, the East is also very hip to the fact that, you know, money and, you know, is pulling out 
and you know demand is near shoring and they're trying right. to get closer supply chain uh, but the, by this by the same token if you're doing a lot of sensitive government stuff and you know you have itar and all of a sudden it, you make a bad decision on a customer or a jv with some entity that could be a non-helpful customer right that could get you that could cause you to lose business Mm -hmm. the customers, right? So you have to be very vigilant about it. And I think the good news is it's a market where, there, where there's so much backlog on customers and we're turning away business in our portfolio in that in those areas that you can be discriminating. And that's what you want. You want lines of customers where you can control and throttle the urgency and hopefully price insensitive, right? Now, if, if, it, if it went the other way and we had all this capacity that wasn't being filled and there was a supply demand imbalance, Right. A little more creative and exploratory on, on just who's in that sort of like multinational company. But, you know, for the time being, it's been fantastic to not have to even think about any concessionary customers. OK, well, you mentioned the space tech and you have a space tech company. Tell us what that space tech company does. Yeah, we have a handful of them. The, the, the stuff I do at ATX is the publicly facing stuff. There's a lot of stuff that we do behind the scenes where we just, you know, we're on a cap table. We're helping out. We're setting up dominoes and introducing talent, but we're not, they either haven't done a big price round yet. So basically we use our imbalance sheet to warehouse for our fund. So I love sourcing, right? You know, and getting out there and getting on cap tables and being helpful to things without putting on crunch base, without getting your fund involved. And then you're the heir apparent. You already know the founders. You already have been there. And then boom, you're not going to get, you're not going to get smoked by anybody. Nobody's going to come in and snag your price crown from you when you've been there mm -hmm. with the founders and introduced them to the team and the first customer. I don't care if it's some name brand tier one firm, they're not going to get in or you're at least going to let them paper the term sheet and do whatever you want for pro rata, right? That's how the game is played. And so um, that's something that's interesting. I think most fund managers don't know, especially emerging managers. They kind of figuring it out, right? Like if you can source routinely and you can add value, the best founders will take your money and the big firms will line up behind you for sure. Absolutely. Because they can put money in full life cycle. They're managing billions. They really care about missing a, a $3 million check. What they care about is not being able to write the $30 million check. Sure. So from our, from the space company, Slingshot Aerospace, you know, it's one of my old co-founders. We've had multiple exits together. Uh, we had a, did a fund returning investment uh, together in our first fund. And uh, he said, I'm leaving this business. It's probably a billion, $2 billion business. And he's right. We sold it to Vista for about 500 million. Um, you know, we were seed series A investors in that. And I was a big angel in it too. And he said, there's only a couple of markets I'm going to go into. I've already made my money. I'm purpose driven. He's got, you know, daughters he shipped off to college, got a divorce. And he said, space, cleaning the oceans and defying age. That's it. I don't care about anything else. And he sees video games coming at him, software, enterprise software. He's like, I don't care. My life's not worth it. Like if I'm going to go, I'm going to go big because I'm voting with my life and I'm not a 25 year old anymore, right? I'm 50 years old and I've already had multiple exits. I've made the, the rich richer. I've made my employees wealthy. And if I'm going to do it, it's going to be in one of those three things. And he's kind of a nerdy guy like me, grew up in Houston. We all love space. And so he started the operating system of space. He's like, I don't want to get into launch. I don't want the asset intensity. I don't want to get into satellites. I don't want to compete with big launch companies. I don't want to compete with satellites. I just want to help all of them not to crash. I want to be Switzerland and monetize everybody and only be on the data and intelligence side. And we're like, that sounds fantastic. So we backed him and that company Slingshot Aerospace, and it has been phenomenal. Like we've got InQtel and Lockheed Martin and all the strategics plus Valor and, you know, uh, Advents, so like big space PE growth equity funds. And I'm still on the board and I'm working with one of my best friends. Right. What's better in life than to do that? Like do what you love with who you want to do it with and, and where you want to be. Absolutely. And so that's the kind of stuff like platforms, big tech platforms that are just either enabling everybody or going into a giant new growth category and defining the rules of engagement. Right. Those okay. Are, two things I like. Okay. So Protopia fits within that definition? It does. So that's kind of a similar thing. So, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of automation, a lot of ML. So like ML is basically a, a compute problem. You know, at the end of the day, there's the, every time you do something, you have to think about where's there, where's this capacity? A squeeze over here, what's going to happen over here, right? Like it's not 
it's not that hard. Like what, like what domino are you flicking over? Like, look up, where's it going to land? Right. I mean, it's, you have to play the short game and the long game simultaneously all times, all continents and all industries are interconnected. And so when you see that, it's like, all right, well, if the world is going to, if, if software is going to eat the world, like Andreessen said, right. Well, software will be automation will be ML AI. What does that need? GPUs, cloud, right. Compute basically. And so how much compute is there? Not enough. Look at what's happening. And it couldn't happen to a nicer guy too, Jensen. I mean, Jensen, he was kind of <laughs> those video game guys. Back in the day, it was adult content and video games. That was NVIDIA's market, right? So we got to meet him. Like he was great. He'd be there all the time running around. And so you knew that he was just onto something interesting with his GPUs. And he's like, if you're really the capacity for compute, I mean, that's one stock I wish I would have held. But uh, he's right. And so the thing about it, if you talk to somebody in NVIDIA who... We had some friends there, obviously. And one of them was the head of NVIDIA Labs. And he's like, look, I'm leaving NVIDIA. I'm leaving to start one specific company. And I was like, what is that company? He's like, data privacy. He's like, until you can give your data to third-party LLMs, manage it yourself, hybrid it, whatever, until you can hand somebody and say, compute the heck out of this and drive insights for me because I need an AI strategy on my business without exposing any sensitive data, you will not get enterprise spend. Let me rub, let me break that down for the people on here. I guess there's a lot of fund managers trying to figure out how to have a returning fund, right? This is a real thing. Enterprise businesses, so think Fortune 1000, we've all heard big data. They've been running big data strategies since inception. Who's my customer? How much, how much can I mine on information from my customer and create these moats around my better data? I can sell them more, better LTV, have better marketing, whatever. Well, guess what? You built those giant moats around your precious data and now you need to use AI. So you, can, you, so you can't give it to, you can't give your precious data to a third party because now their competitors can do it as well. And all that data, you throw in white male, 50 years old, O positive. You're throwing all this stuff in, personal information, all that, giving it to a third party who's effectively an arms dealer because they're going to monetize all your competitors as well. Or you lay the infrastructure to actually do that in-house. And look how much money Microsoft spent just on open AI and everything else, right? And I'm talking billions of dollars to get in and actually train an initial data set and, and, and feed it learning data and get to a point of efficiency to have your own internal AI program. So that's what we did. So he said, I'm going to come out. I'm going to create the first, you know, complete obfuscation tool that lets anybody model anything. You can pass it from the cloud, on-prem, back and forth, third parties, and that will unlock enterprise AI. And I was like, I can't write a check fast enough. Let's do it. Let's go. And so that's that's what Protopia is doing. And they've effectively partnered with every big enterprise software company out there that's already got enterprise customers, mm -hmm. need data privacy solutions, and want to spend more AI money on AI. So like their, their decision maker would be a chief data officer, a head of enterprise AI, a CISO, a CTO, a C CTO. It's yeah. all getting stove pipe there. But once you can make it safe to run AI at scale yeah. and drive insights for fortune 500 companies, yeah. that budget on AI spend is going to go through the roof. It's, it's okay. Exciting. Yeah. No. So this is really a security deal, a cybersecurity deal, isn't it? It, it, yeah, it, I would put it in the cyber bucket. Yeah, I mean that's kind of yeah. a good way to look at it. It's 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 yeah. security, data privacy, security around yeah. AI and ML compute. Yeah, yeah. Because there was a question about whether you had a security deal, so I think this fits. No, that. I'm I'm an LP in a couple sure. of security funds. I've got I've got some security like like we call each other Jedi Masters, right? Like security is one of those things where if you're in it, you are in it. It's just like pharma. Like if you're doing pharma, you do pharma. If you're doing fintech, you do. There's, there's these there are these unforgiving industries where you really need to be a subject matter expert. Okay, okay. Well, good. Uh, this is a lot to absorb, and uh, we have some questions here as well. So let me see what they are. Um, okay, we answered that one. Um, all right. Who has a question that they would like to ask, Chris? I can keep going in the meantime. 
Um, maybe I don't know if there's fun, more fun managers on here or what. I mean, yeah. I probably, probably what would you like, like to know about how Chris manages the fund and, you know, what, I mean, have you ever made a mistake? I guess you said you sold NVIDIA too early, but what about in your fund management life? Oh, tons of mistakes. I mean, the thing is, is like, I don't lament my mistakes. Like I, I kind of cherish them. Like lose, lose fast, lose small and learn. Okay. That's, lose that's the thing. Like you, and any early stage investor who's scared to fail or make mistakes is probably a, not a good fund manager, right? <laughs> you know? Okay. So tell us about one of those, you know, you lost fast, you lost small and you moved on. Tell us about yeah, one of those. Um, being too early, you know, like seeing something where you've got some early adopter head fakes and the mass market's not ready for spend. You're yeah. effectively going to have to carry that company a little longer to wait for that wave to crypto. To okay. Really boost. So being uh, early, that... I understand that. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We've all seen that, right? But I mean, you can get head faked by being part of your own network. And by asking the initial representation representative group, this is really common, I think, in like bigger hubs where you sort of think, oh, that's the world. The world is Las Gatos or, you know, Palo or Menlo, right? Well, that's not really the world. But I think if you're in the Midwest, you kind of see things more clear as far as what the real world is, especially if you have an international presence. But being too early. Um, so I think just, you know, how do you get out of it and, and send people back to their lives? So um, no rock star founder or executive wants to hang out and push into the wind, right? Like it's nice to have a tailwind. So if it's futile, recognize it, do something and liberate. And I use that word purposely, mm. liberate your team, the founders, the employees, send them on their way. Don't let them waste five years of their life when they quit their nice fat job at Google or Microsoft to go be an entrepreneur. It's not fair, right? So give it to them straight, let them know they're too early. Or pivot out of it if you can, um, but don't be afraid to pack it up. And then the other thing is, is backing founders who really couldn't get out of their own way, right? Great from zero to one, love that CEO title. Couldn't, you know, couldn't, they were basically became the constraint. The, the, the most powerful and influential people in the company became the biggest hindrance. And so sussing that out in the beginning is really important. And that's why most of the founders I back, frankly, are already people I've won with. Or oh, they're good. founders that are in network. I don't have a lot of first timers in my fund. That's good. Um, so uh, we have a question here in the chat box about whether you invest in SaaS, SaaS deals, software as a service. And as follow up to that, is there a minimum ARR that you will invest with? No, I mean, yeah, software. I mean, that's enterprise software SaaS. So that's pretty much. 90% of what we do, I'd say. 90% of what you do. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a software AI ML shop, right? You yeah. know, some managed marketplaces with software. The yeah. AAR thing, I think that's a head fake. What does that really mean? AAR is a, any any VC who's like, give me a million or two million ARR, show me that. They're, that's just an option conversation for them to continue to watch you. The real mm -hmm. question is, is, it's a surrogate. Like, you know, what does two and a half million dollars of ARR actually mean? I'd be like, how many customers did you have? How long have you had them? How much are they buying? Okay. Show me all the KPIs. And are there that customer your college roommate? Or right. did you find the conference? Or did they come into your website? Like, it's really easy. All you're trying to do with ARR is validate that there's some customer that wants your product. And if you actually know what questions to ask, how much ARR you have is a lot less relevant. And oh, by the way, if you sit there as a founder, because all the, all the VCs who are, senior associates and principals said, keep us posted when you get to 2 million. Well, guess what? Now they're all going to compete for each at the deal at $2 million, right? Versus if you know what questions to ask and you can actually understand that this Sorry. is 500,000 of ARR from a really healthy customer segment who you didn't have any unfair advantage in winning and they love your product and can't wait to buy more. Bam, you drop a term sheet on that. Right. That, that's a very good answer. I get it. Uh, Hal Kelman is on the screen, and I think he might have a question. So, Hal, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the, the great part about living in the Bay Area is that your next door neighbors and everyone else are world class people. Like the person living next to me is the guy who invented Gmail, and uh, the, what's her name? Uh, the one who who uh, 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 coined the name. Uh, you know, for uh, for a billion dollar companies uh, is another neighbor. So, uh, where do you get your inspiration in in Texas? Uh, is it m mostly recent people who moved there, 
like Joe Lansdale uh, or have there been long term people that you've known forever in Texas? No, that's a good question, Harold. So like I was very fortunate where um, being an operator early on in a small town like Austin at the time, I got to meet a bunch of family office, older people who really they liked the military background. I was always there to help. Right. Wasn't asking them for anything. And I got introduced to Tom Perkins back when he was married to Danielle Steele um, before he got sick. And he was one of my mentors. Right. Uh, to some extent. Yeah. And and Tom Perkins was a great guy. He gave me a computer. True story. 1969 entrepreneur out of Michigan. He gave us one hundred thousand dollars worth of the new a Hewlett Packard computers for an 18 month old company with $3,000, Tom Perkins, when he ran Hewlett Packard. That's the, wow. that's why I moved to Silicon Valley. And that's the type of people here. I love it. And I, and I used to spend a lot of time out there. I, mean, I still get out there for the wine country. I've got two little kids now and stuff, but that really is, I mean, the intelligentsia there. And I've got friends that were, you know, founding GPs at foundation and other places. And I catch up with those guys, right? Great, great people in the Bay area, but that's really what it was. And every time I get back on that plane and go home, I'd be like, look, I just learned from the best and brightest, but I don't need to be surrounded by all these savants who are competing potentially or, you know, potentially collaborating too. I'd rather just go back to my place and be, you know, the old adage in the, the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. You know, I'm probably a, what, 20 years older than Joe Lonsdale. I don't know. Like, you know, I'm probably- uh, Joe, than- Joe, I met, I met <laughs> Joe when he was 17 in my garage from Mission San Jose. He said, if I go to- uh, uh, Stanford, it'll change my life. I said, Joe, it will change your life. And he did. You can ask him that. He's now uh, 44 years old. Okay. That's good, awesome. good. Yeah, yeah. Then, no. He, so there's not a 20 year gap there, Chris. It's much less, <laughs> less than, than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So there's a question here from David Have you seen a change in the types of companies that make it through investment committee in the past few years? specifically around investments that require multiple additional found fundraising rounds to achieve profitability versus those that achieve profitability without raising additional capital. Okay, David, thank you for that question. So yeah, so in, in summary, is, is capital efficiency in vogue? Yes. Was it previously? <laughs> Not really, right? Um, that's So hopefully that's the like answer you're looking for. Uh, the reality is if it's too capital efficient, and you don't need to take money, that's a problem. You got to remember, right. funds need to put money to work. So what they don't want is spendthrift. What they do want is the ability to put more money in to sell more. Mm-hmm. And so if you're too capital efficient to where you're not going to raise more money and you don't need, you don't think you need to raise more money, that's not so good for the private equity venture capital universe because they're trying to put money to work. Um, right. So the answer is, is like you have a business where you could raise money if you want to, and do you want to hit the scale button or hit the bootstrap button? That's right. really, I think it. And then how big is the market, right? Like if it's not a big market that can't have a fund returning investment, us fund managers, I mean, frankly, it's a, we're very predictable people. Like if we can't invest in a company that can return our entire fund, who cares? As a founder, there's all kinds of other stuff. In fact, most companies don't fit venture capital. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Nothing at all. In fact, it's probably a beautiful thing. But if you in, I think the world's punch drug on on venture capital, but it only works for a small subset of companies and the failure rate is really, really high. So just make sure if you're going to take that red pill versus the blue pill, that is a market opportunity sizable enough. And you can have a real business model with customers fast enough to be able to go from the from the qualitative to the quantitative and to raise sequential rounds of funding if and when you need them to really give it a shot. Yeah, well put. Uh, Wyatt, I saw you had your screen on, your camera on. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Uh, First of all, thank you, Chris, for taking the time to come on and uh, answer some questions. Uh, I'm a former founder, and I'm also getting my MBA at Texas A&M, and I'm involved with the Aggie Angel Network, and I'm from a horse racing background. So I saw that you're actually involved with uh, Luxus and Mm -hmm. that you're looking at uh, alternative assets. And I currently manage a portfolio of racehorses myself. So I was seeing if you could tell me a little bit about that business. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, as one, I mean, Harold probably knows what we're talking about here, but Rebecca too, as one gets a taste of success and, you know, you start to have hobbies, some of those hobbies are expensive. Uh, And so, you know, 
racehorses is one, are, is one of them, you know, um, but I, uh, it's interesting to me because there's, it's kind of like oil. It's kind of like the, a lot of things are, you know, it's how is it the same? How is it different? Yes, they're alive. These assets are alive, but they consume, they have certain stakeholders that have to help them and then they go and go race and they can make money, right? And they can, they're owned through partnerships. They can be fractionalized. So to me, I look at them like it's a timber forest. It's an oil well, you know, it is a asset that's alive that could be jointly owned that has some level of data predictability between between here and here and how much potential money they could make. And so that all could create a financial instrument and whether it's art or wine or racehorses or gems or whatever, the same thing can be said, right? And so once one enters the kind of family office world, which is a loose name, I mean, what's a family office? Who knows, man, you know, but basically once you don't have to work for a living and you're on the private jet, this is a this is a world you're going to spend a lot of time in, and it's what you own and where you spend your time and what you're doing, and it's a whole other world. Um, but that's why I invested in that. So the racehorse thing, yes, I have a couple LPs that are, you know, big into that. I'm into it a little bit via them, and you know, I'm going to Ascot. I don't know if you're going to go to that, but you know, got to go in into UK and spend some time over there right now and then. So what better way to do it than Ascot and Derby's coming up. So don't know if that answers your question, but that's probably not a conversation for this. That's a very nuanced asset. That's over 95% of venture capitalists heads anyway, because what do they know about horses, right? Right. Except it might be a good tax deduction. That is very true. <laughs> so then that, that's another element of driving some of these things. Again, back to the venture capital thing. It's not for everybody, but if you can get a working interest and in something that you can depreciate the heck out of oil, real estate, horses, whatever, it's not a bad thing. Three X and a bunch of tax write-offs along the way, it's not bad. Right. right. So, so I noticed that uh, your funds are, they're not huge size funds, but you're also right now raising a new fund and you're pretty much far, pretty far along with that. Are you looking to upsize uh, your fund, your firm? Uh, what, what are your growth prospects? Are you going to try to stay this kind of where you are right now? Because that's really what works for you. We know that's a great question. That's something my partners and I talk about all the time. And I've been an LP in a lot of funds that I've watched kind of transition, right? And, you know, kind of, I don't want to say lose their grace, but you just have to decide whether you're in the asset management game or the money or making money game. And uh, you can be a little bit of both, right? But I like being early stage. It's what gives me energy. It's what I'm good at. So it's kind of like, hey, look, this is where we're good. Like we can win here. Undisputedly, we are winning here. We're having fun. And I don't want to compete with my partners. I got some, I have some really good series BC kind of growth equity guys. We have a good little big brother, little brother kind of dynamic. And I don't want to go try and do their job. And they sure as hell don't want to get to part of market fit, right? Early stage is a lot of work and they'd rather make, manage a lot of AUM and not have to deal with product market fit. So I enjoy that early stage. And ultimately too, just because you're not putting money from the fund to work doesn't mean you're not putting money to work. We have a ton of money in co-invest and I put a lot of my money into co-invest and my GP partners too, because we already have inside information. We already have major ownership in these companies. We already know the founders. Why would we not put more money to work? Mm -hmm. We buy secondary from founders that are friends. We co-invest along the growth equity guys through SPVs. Um, I mean, there's a lot of money to be made betting on what you uniquely know and the access you uniquely have. And just because you don't put it into a fun construct. Yeah. I mean, I, actually, I think. That, and I like it actually that way. I like not having to put something into my fund that isn't a fund returning check, right? Like it really takes a disciplined mind. It's easier to manage more money. I can tell you that right now. It's easier to raise more money from bigger investors and just kind of but then you start taking less risk. You get a little comfortable. You kind of lose your edge. So I, I like creating a sandbox through a lifestyle choice, where you live, what hobbies you have, who you're married to, all of these decisions you make define how you see the universe and how you spend your time. Mm -hmm. And if you start to raise more money because it's easy, mm -hmm. then now you have to put that money to work. And then you're like, wow, this, I either need to write more checks or those checks need to be bigger and if they're bigger and I'm writing more of them, can I return the fund on any one of my portfolio companies? And it starts to get sloppy. And I can tell you right now, I'm a buyout LP. 
right? Like growth equity versus buyout. I'll take buyout all day long because at least you get control. And it all, it all blends the two and a half X anyway. whoop de doo right? And in buyout, you're probably going to get it faster. So like the IRR is probably better in buyout versus growth equity and you get control. Wow. So in terms of your funds right now, how much uh, capital and reserve do you have to make new investments, like percentage wise? We reserve about, from our initial check, we reserve about 3X. We, we try to put 75% of our capital into the top 25% of our companies. So that's really a, okay. that's a masterful needle to thread. It's hard to do, yeah. Um, yeah. but it, that, that is how in at least, and there's lots of opinion. The thing about venture capital, this is my opinion, but there's 10 other ways to play it. And the funny thing about early stage venture, like if you talk to real estate guys or, you know, energy gals, there's kind of a best practice way to do it. That's pretty much gospel, but I know other fund managers that are spray and pray, low ownership, they get in. And they have fun, you know, they, they can have three X, five X funds. Right. Mm -hmm. But then it's so just, it's just what you're good at, but generally they don't take board seats. They're really cool people you want to hang out with. Their job is cocktails and conversation, right. And being cool kids and moving fast. Right. They don't want the board seats. Right. They generally aren't, aren't big, heavy builders. They just want right. to be in the room and they want to have, you know, a little piece of a really cool logo that could yeah. go crazy asymmetric. And if they keep their AUM small, it can return their fund. So I think if you control your AUM, it's easier to have a great performing fund and keep your LPs happy. However, mm -hmm. if you have a really small AUM, you can kiss goodbye big allocators because the math doesn't work. Mm, That's right. challenge. But it doesn't have to be either or. It can be both and. You can have an early stage fund and a growth fund and have a growth team that just loves hanging out post product market fit. You could do this over here and have an opportunity fund. You could do this and have a sidecar fund. What I think is actually the worst, and this is probably gonna get me in a lot of trouble, but who cares? I mean, people need to shoot each other straight. Tom Perkins was like that. He was a straight shooter. Got him into trouble. I love the guy. But here's the thing is if you go full life cycle, can come in anywhere, stage agnostic, industry agnostic, giant money machine, can lead, can follow, whatever, that is beta. And by beta, I mean absolute mediocrity. But you know what? There's a lot of people that love it, right? Because it's easy. It's buying IBM. Nobody got fired for buying IBM. And so that's just a different animal. That's the private jet animal. That's the, you know, the board meeting of optimization animal, right? But if you really want to buy a business and fix it, be a buyout person. If you want to launch companies and create categories and are comfortable with risk, be early stage, but don't go into an early stage company as a growth equity person and try and empathize with them and, and add some value because you're just a fish out of water. So I think you got to know what's your game, play your right. game, and then not leave money on the table. Just because you're not investing in your fund doesn't mean you can't invest. And if you have access to something interesting, and if you have influencer control, there's capital for you. So never let money be the problem. Money is a commodity. Back to the early stage stuff. Right. Where you go in the world, anybody with money, all they talk about is access. And people with access, all they talk about is money. So it's just, they, they could just meet each other, right? You know? <laughs> so that, that's what your firm has done, really, is found this gap in the marketplace. And, uh, and you really are very focused and disciplined. I got that message loud and clear from you. <laughs> Um, and also very focused on, you know, the geographic markets as well, Texas and South Central U.S. Um, so that's another differentiator, I think, with your firm. It is, Rebecca. You know, it's, I think that's the least defensible, though, right? Like COVID's taught us okay. that. Like, I, yeah. I'd rather be the smartest industry person in a room than the most. Yeah. And, and, and in, in, in supply chain specifically, like I'm spending a lot of time abroad, right? And there. But these other markets that are emerging markets, you know, is the risk worth the reward from a labor cost perspective? Maybe from a regulatory perspective, maybe is the talent there in mass. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it takes a team. And so that team of five needs to be 500. Where are the vice presidents? Where are the directors? Who knows how to hit the ground running and build a tech company? I would argue that most of the emerging manager or emerging market, emerging manager illusions have a real chasm to solve between series A and C because you have to go to scale and scaling in a market that doesn't have 
mature, experienced talent is tough, if not impossible. Well, there were a lot of lessons in this uh, BC show today, and thank you so much. Uh, let's give Chris a round of applause. Yay, Chris, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, hey, everyone's saying paid. awesome. <laughs> everyone's saying awesome, super. So uh, we are going to replay this um, on our YouTube channel so that everybody can learn from you. And I think uh, there was tremendous amount of learning in today's show. So thank you again, Chris. Um, we're going to stay in Texas because uh, Texas is where there's a tremendous amount of talent and a tremendous amount of tech and capital too. Um, and it's right in the center of some trends that are going on as well. So in two weeks time on the 26th, uh, please tune in with us again, 4 p.m. East Coast time. Uh, and uh, yeah, again, thank you so much, Chris. Anything you want to add? Well, I would just thank up? you for the the questions, right? It's it's all about good questions. And you, had, you asked some great questions today. And I love what you're doing here, too. I think transparency for both for operators, for fund managers who are aspiring and for LPs is a really good thing. And you're, you're doing some great work. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank you. See you in Austin. See you in Austin. Take, take care. Bye-bye.